I'm going to talk this plotting session about Brandon's philosophy on plot. When we do plot uh, number two, I'll try to give you some other tools. We'll talk a little more about the uh, hero's journey. We'll talk about three-act structure. We'll do all that stuff in the second plot lecture. So first up, you're just getting Brandon's take on it. We'll do this with setting and character, too. You'll probably first get a lecture on Brandon's take on things, and then a lecture on if that doesn't work for you, which for a lot of you, it probably won't. But hopefully, it'll teach you some things that you can apply. We'll move on to other things. So Brandon's plotting method um, is about, I actually found a way that this all is, uh, is alliterative. It is about promises. It is about progress. And it is about payoff. I like to try to view stories as a sequence of promises, progress along that promise, and payoff. Of which, progress is actually the most important of the three for the bulk of the amount of writing you do. But promise is where things go wrong the most often. Um, so I'll talk you through a few times where I made improper promises, caught it because of good beta readers, tweaked the story, and it ended up working. Um, so when plot is going wrong, I think it is usually, at least for me, not understanding these three things. People go into a story um, giving you a certain benefit of the doubt. If they weren't giving it to you, they would not be opening your story. They wouldn't pick that book up and read it. Some of them might be tougher audiences and tougher cells than others, but every one of them has opened that book and started reading. They are offering you something. They're extending their hand to you. In return, what they are wanting you to do is quickly give them some promises about what type of story this is and why it's going to be enjoyable. All right? Those promises take several forms. Um, and they work in different ways. One of the promises you're going to give them is a tone promise. Um, another promise is generally going to be a genre prom promise. Um, and usually, your packaging of your story has already made this promise. Um, but it's important to recognize genre is one of these things you are promising them. You're going to uh, give them a promise about the plot. Specifically, the type of progress that's going to come in this story. Uh, this is the promise of this, what is going to make you turn the page. And you're usually going to be making some promises about character. Did I spell that right? I didn't. Character! It's spelled right now. You can't tell me it's not. It's in my own language. Um, You guys actually have Adam who can like zoom up on this, so you can actually see my terrible handwriting. Whereas in the normal class, they just have to sit back and be like, does that act, did, did he, I can't make, yeah. You get to see it in like glorious HD. Um, 4K. 4K. 4K scribbles on a whiteboard. <laughs> um, yeah. All right, so <laughs> promises. These promises um, can indeed be undermined in some ways. Almost every plot twist, in a way, is a slight change or ch uh, twist on one of your promises. And we'll talk about that later on when we get to payoffs. right? Um, and a lot of your promises that you'll be making is that I am going to give you this expected thing, but it's going to be better than you expect. Um, tone, let's talk about this one first. Tone promise usually is telling people, when they pick up the book, what type of feel the book is going to have. Um, this kind of gets into, is it going to be whimsical? Is it going to be humorous? Is it going to be dark and gritty? Is this going to be adventuresome? Um, you can do different subgenres of every genre dealing with those tones. You can write a romance that is adventuresome, or that is whimsical, or that is comedic. Um, you can write a fantasy even in a specific subgenre. You can write an epic fantasy that is dark and gritty. You can write an epic fantasy that is hopeful, but uh, you know, points of light in darkness where there are certain, it's going to be a rough world, but there are points of light. You can write one that is going to be fun and whimsical, 
You can write one that is going to be a comedy. All of these things are important promises at the start of your story. I don't fixate as much as a lot of uh, writing teachers I've seen on your first line nearly as much. Uh, writers tend to fixate on it too much, in my opinion. Uh, what you want to have in that opener is a indica an indication of what kind of story it is. Your opening paragraph should offer some sort of motion. I recommend this for every type of story because every story should be promising motion. There should be some sort of conflict, promise of change, or some sort of motion. Um, even if you are writing um, you know, a story that is mostly going to be pastoral, um, I often use Pride and Prejudice, right? Um, the opening line of Pride and Prejudice is in conflict with itself because it's irony. I can't quote it exactly, but it's like, the, uh, what is it? Every man in the... No, yes, there you are. That a man in possession of a fortune. Right. So, opening line to a book in the 1800s that is a much slower book than modern ones already says, this is a promise of the tone. It's going to be kind of funny, right? This is also, something is going to change. There is a guy in this book who has a fortune, but does not have a wife, and he wants one. We have motion and change promised in the tone of this. You generally have to be a little faster even than um, books in the 1800s. The more that writing has become a, um, a popular uh, mode of storytelling, the more that you want this opening page to make sure that it has motion and change and if you can at all, an active protagonist who wants something and tr is trying to get it. Uh, you don't have to do any of those things. That's the recipe. But the reason, the chef reason for this is we in our lives have so many things trying to grab our attention. Does not mean that your book has to have ADD um, and uh, you know, work like a, a Vine or what, what, a TikTok where it's 15 seconds long and you grab someone's attention that fast. But what it does have to do is promise motion, promise conflict, promise change. Um, one of the things I often use is a great example of someone who knew what they were doing, and this is Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time. Uh, Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time is a book series um, that is about the end of the world in a fantasy world. It's a fantasy apocalypse. Um, he wanted to start his book with a young boy on a farm uh, in a kind of hero's journey sense in a pastoral location who's going to be forced out onto his hero's journey. He knew that that would give some of the wrong promises to some of the readers because by chapter two, like everything is going crazy already in that book. Um, and so this is why you often see in fantasy books a prologue like Robert Jordan's that takes place during the previous apocalypse of the world ending, showing how awful everything was, um, kind of making all of these cool magical promises of stuff you're going to get to see. It's very short. It's one of the best prologues in all of fantasy. Um, and it says to you as a reader, here is our tone promise. Now we're going to go to the character promise of the young boy on a farm. And by melding these two, you're going to realize this boy's young pastoral perfect life is going to be upended because of an apocalypse that's coming. Just give me time to get there. And you know, as a young reader, I was on board. I understood. I'm like, all right, this is where we're going. I can now give him the time to set up this character properly um, because I have had this promise up front. It's why you see prologues a lot in fantasy novels. Um, definitely ha can become a cliche unto itself, and indeed it can be a recipe thing where you're like, well, fantasy books have prologues. I'll add a prologue. Not every book needs one. Um, not, a lot of books can start with the right tone promise. This doesn't mean that you need to introduce your plot, the actual plot of the book, straight off. Um, what you often want to do is introduce some smaller conflict that then introduces some of the same ideas that are going to be part of your plot. And again, this is a, uh, something that uses a prologue, which you don't need to do. But a great example is uh, Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Right? Lucas and Spielberg love the cold open. 
the cold open where you join someone in the middle of their previous adventure, which they are just wrapping up, which is going to be a small microcosm for the big adventure. You, uh, it's been, you know, everyone knows this now, but in case you don't, you know, you meet Indy. He's this mysterious character. He's cool. He's got a whip. Who has a whip? Um, he's investigating a, um, a temple. He's smart. He outsmarts all of the traps. He gets betrayed, but outsmarts his betrayer. <clears throat> There's this, this wonderful moment where you, Indy knows that this guy is untrustworthy, and so he leads him wrong through one of the traps, uh, where Indy, it's a pressure plate he steps on, but he puts his hand through the, uh, through the light to indicate, oh, the light sets off the trap. The guy dies to that trap after betraying Indy a little bit later, because it was actually the pressure plate. Indy is really smart, and at the end of this thing, Indiana Jones loses anyway, right? Tries really hard, still loses. Um, this is a small sort of plot promise. It's also a tone promise and a genre promise, but the plot promise on this is you're going to see a bigger version of this. You're going to see Indiana Jones struggle. You're going to see that he's really competent and he still gets the crud beat out of him. Uh, he still has to deal with snakes. He still has people betraying him. Um, and he is just as a guy who has a lot of grit and can push through that. And at the end, you're probably going to get some sort of bittersweet ending. Guess what? That is the entire movie, right? They did a very small version of the exact movie. Um, it's, again, why uh, Indiana Jones is used as a really good example of a tightly paced um, Hollywood formula movie. Um, you want to do something like this. It does not need to be on the scale. You don't have to have like a mini adventure that explains the whole adventure that's going to be happening. Um, but having a character who is struggling with a problem that is going to become a major issue once the plot intersects them is a great way to say, look, you're going to see this character grow and struggle with this problem, and it's probably going to become an even bigger problem as the story progresses. Make promises of the type of story. Um, and you know, what kinds of characters you're going to look forward to reading about. Uh, doing this is a really important skill for storytelling. If you don't learn to do this, granted, a lot of people do this by instinct. It's not like you have to use my formula for it. But if you don't learn to make promises and show progress on those promises, your books are going to be boring. And it's really interesting because boredom is this weird construct, right? It usually is the, the reader's like, it's not moving fast enough, or I don't know what's happening, or I'm just not engaged. Not every time, but a lot of times, the problem is that you have made wrong promises, or that you're not showing progress on those promises. Um, if you upfront promise people something, but then your progress is all on a different axis, what's going to happen is, in their heads, they're going to treat the actual progress of the book as a side deviation from the thing they're expecting. So what happens is they stop investing in this, this thing because their brain tells them this is a side story. This is a side mission. This is not important to the main plot. This is a bunch of characters going to Canto Bight and getting their car towed. Um, little dig at the last Jedi there, sorry. Um, your brain says not important. This is not the main plot of the story. Um, and I can't see how this is progressing and how it relates. Conversely, you might say this is their main plot, but you don't signpost that progress is being made. You, as a storyteller, your job is to give a sense of progress. Why a sense of progress? Because all progress in stories is illusionary. Um, you can do anything progress-wise in a story. If you want to say, you are writing an underdog sports story. And you want to say, all right, and then they won the championship. That's the, the next chapter of your book. You're done. You've given them progress. It's happened. You've solved the story, right? Uh, and then she got over her hangups and realized that he really wasn't that bad a guy. He's just really kind of bad at making introductions himself to new people. And they got along swimmingly, got married. The end. Right? There's one sentence resolution to, um, to a plot. You can also, if you really wanted to, don't do this, but you could write 50 pages 
where only one second passes. I guarantee that every one of you could do that. Uh, you could describe in minute detail in a frozen moment everything happening in this frozen moment uh, and go on and on and on, and you can fill your whole book with that, right? You have absolute control over how fast your book moves and how, or how slowly the book moves. Your reader needs a sense that goals exist for the characters, that goals exist for the story, and that progress is being made toward those. And the different type of subgenre and genre you are doing in your story is going to tell you what those signposts should be, right? Um, this is where it gets a little complicated because every story is doing multiples of these, right? Um, again, if we use uh, Star Wars, uh, because a lot of people have seen it and it is a really tight screenplay, you have kind of an opening promise, right? Uh, from the, from a New Hope. The opening promise is little ship, big ship, bad guy in black armor, good character in white clothing who, is, who has uh, friendly little droids, right? Uh, what is your tone promise? Science fiction about the little ship against the big ship. Uh, first image in the movie tells you what the story is about. Um, and so that's your first promise. Little ship versus big ship, right? Well, then nested, I'm drawing brackets here, is your next prompt set of promises, which are the kind of actual plot promise, which is where Princess Leia says, take these plans to Obi-Wan Kenobi. He can save us. So you've got a plot that is kind of a bit of a travel log. A character has to go to a place and find a person. Travel plot, right? Um, go to a place, find a person. So you're nesting these. Big plot is we're going to, uh, little ship's going to beat the big ship. Uh, sm set, smaller plot is find this person, go to this place, travel to this place. Then it cuts to Luke, and you have your character promise, right? And in your character promise, Luke Skywalker is, doesn't want to go do whatever he's supposed to do. And instead, he walks out and looks up at the double suns and is like, man, I want to go out there and have an adventure. This guy wants an adventure. Right? Um, and so what happens is Lucas starts working on these various stories as he goes, and he will open up small little promises and pay off in the middle. Like you find Obi-Wan Kenobi, but the travel plot gets expanded. This is a very common sort of twist you put in your stories is where you expand a previous plot into a larger plot. The travel plot changes from find Obi-Wan to we need to go off planet and go uh, find this princess and bring these plans to the rebellion, right? The travel plot gets bigger. And the character adventure gets bigger, doesn't it? He meets Obi-Wan, and Obi-Wan says, you must learn the ways of the Force and train to be a Jedi. Guess what your adventure's going to be? You wanted to have one? Here is what it's actually going to be. You are now expanding to not just going on adventure, you're going to become a Jedi, right? And this is all very well signposted as part of the big plot, little versus big. Why are we going to go on our travel log? Because this will help us destroy the big ship. And in fact, we will find the biggest ship ever. <coughs> we will expand our plot to, holy cow, it's a big old Death Star, right? It's not just a big ship, it's the biggest ship that's ever been built. And we gotta blow that up with a little ship. Um, travel plot says, if we can get to this place, we can blow up the biggest ship by using little ships. The character thing, why do you need to become a Jedi? Because Darth Vader killed your dad and he's on the big ship, <laughs> right? Um, everything is related back. And so as Lucas is signposting each of these things, you are told reasons why you should care and it is indicated to you, we are making progress, right? And then you kind of out starts outlining the steps. This is very common in a travelogue. We need to go to Moss Eisley Spaceport to find a pilot. When we have done that, we have achieved a step in our journey, right? 
And almost all the journeys, uh, the steps in uh, Star Wars are journey steps. It's mostly a uh, character um, uh, that is a, a hero's journey with an actual literal journey that is a travel log. That's the type of plot progress you're getting most of the time. And so we go there, we find a pilot, uh, and indeed, this pilot is a big old meanie, right? Han is mean and scruffy looking, right? He's a scruffy looking nerf herder um, or whatever. Um, and you open up a new character plot. Han is mean. We wish Han weren't mean because he's also cool. Maybe we can have a little character journey for Han where Han is no longer, uh, you know, Han is no longer mean. Um, and you have little bits in this where you, uh, where you open up a, a, a new one that is, all right, to get these plans, we actually actually got sucked into the Death Star, right? Oh no, we're sucked into the Death Star. We were trying to get to the right place. The right place isn't there anymore. Instead, there's a Death Star and we now have the expansion of even bigger ship, right? And then, we start closing the brackets, right? All right. We close the Death Star plot. Uh, not the Death Star, they get off the Death Star, right? Uh, we close that one out by us escaping, but it costs us Obi-Wan Kenobi. That's bad. That's an escalation. Now we have to do these other three things, four things, with no Obi-Wan Kenobi. Suddenly, you have another twist and it's expansion of the danger um, and the scope by taking away the strongest member uh, and the support of the team, right? Um, you then actually close the travel plot by getting where you're supposed to be. So they close a little bit out of order. This does happen, um, but you close the travel plot. And then you close the character plot. Right? You close the character plot by having the moment where Luke is going to trust the Force, right? Um, where Luke has learned. And this, these, two, these next ones happen almost in exact quick succession. In fact, I think you close the Han plot first, don't you? Uh, Han comes back and he's not a meanie anymore, right? And he saves you. Um, then you close the Jedi plot. Guess what? Luke's turning off his targeting computer. He's become a Jedi. Not really, but enough for this book or this movie. And then what happens last, right? We have Han, these two I think I got backwards. Um, then you, what happens? A little ship blows up a really big ship, right? Um, and an exact reversal of the opening shot, the little ship blows up the big ship. Um, the important thing to remember about these is this sense of progress. Let me ask you guys, do you get a sense that Luke is learning the ways of the Force through the course of the story? Yes, he fights a little ball that shoots him. He learns about stuff. Ha uh, Han is mean about it. Is Han mean? Yes, but does Han stop being quite so mean? You see progress for Han along this thing. Well, maybe we can save a princess. Maybe I like that princess. Maybe I like this guy. Maybe this is actually worth fighting for something rather than looking out only for myself. You see progress. You've been promised it, and you signpost it. Um, do you see that they are making progress in their travel? Yes. We've got to go here and do this thing. Now we've got to go here. We went there, and it's gone, and we had a little venture on the Death Star. Next travel is escape the Death Star. Then we got to get to the Rebels. We do that pretty quickly. Travel plot has been signposted all along, and this is kind of your structure for the first Star Wars movie, which is why we hold it up as such a great example because the th great thing is that I love is that these three close almost simultaneously. And so what's happening is two character plot things, we'll talk about this more in character, both Han and Luke's character climaxes overlap in a matter of a few minutes and then it is the, those two things, closing, learning the force and Han coming back that allow them to destroy the Death Star, right? The, you can, the little ship can destroy the big ship because we trust in the Force and we're good friends, right? You, you, we joke about this, but the Death Star was destroyed by the power of friendship. Without the power of friendship, 
no Death Star getting destroyed because Luke dies. Um, and so the character moments happen in service of achieving your main goal. This all ties up in a really great bow. Everyone gets a medal but Chewie. Um, and uh, movie ends. R2-D2 is happy. Um, and so what can we learn from this? It's this progress thing that is so important that people get wrong a lot of times. We're going to erase this, but uh, so take a screenshot uh, if you want to have this for some reason. Um, right? <clears throat> Identifying the type of progress that you are going to be writing into your story and then making the proper pr uh, promises and then signposting that as you go is the way to go about this in kind of the Brandon method. Wow, 623 already. So I got like, I got, it's 650? Yeah, we got a little time. Um, so what I try to do when I'm building my, uh, my books um, is I don't build a traditional outline that is like heading one, subheading B, these sorts of things. I ask myself, what kind of things do I want to have happen at the end of my book? I outline backward. What are my payoffs that I want to earn? When I write a story where a character is going to use the magic in a really interesting and cool way at the end of the story, um, I imagine that scene and say, all right, I got to earn that scene. What do I got to do during that scene? Well, first, the character has to practice. Right? We have an apprentice plot. And we have to explain the magic. And usually, we have some sort of mystery. Right? A lot of my books that you'll read, I love mysteries about the magic system because uh, it's just a thing that I love. Um, so the characters will be trying to figure out how the magic works while they're training in it and while it's getting explained to the reader. <laughs> and I will then say, all right, what sort of progress can I show along these things? And I like to try to identify the types of, of progress for certain sub-elements of a story. For instance, if you've got a mystery in your story, you need them to discover clues. Information is usually a progress in a mystery. You give information. Some of it's red herrings. Um, some of it is actual information, uh, some of it's partial information, but you can identify, all right, the progress on that is going to be getting information. But with the character getting better at a skill, a lot of times in movies, it's a montage or something like that. For, but in a book, basically you're going to say, all right, here are my kind of signposts of showing that they're getting better, right? Um, in Star Wars, it's let's make sure we show a scene where Luke has the blast shield down and is trying to sense what he's supposed to do to imitate being in the cockpit later on with a helmet on. Um, and let's show that right now he can actually kind of do it, but not really well. And so you have this nice scene where he's got a lightsaber um, and things like that. What's another thing you need? You need Obi-Wan Kenobi to speak in his head because he's going to give him the last piece of advice at the end, right? You've already imagined this ending. And so you're like, all right, we need a scene where Obi-Wan Kenobi says, through the force, go do this, Luke. And we do that right after Ben dies, right? Um, and so we have this, you know, escape, get away, Luke. Follow Obi-Wan's directions um, and things like that. You have these scenes. If you're writing a book about this, you devise these scenes and show progress of the character's uh, skill with the magic through the course of the story or whatever it is they're learning so that at the end, the reader has been able to watch these signposts. It is really fun to watch a character get better at something. Lots of reasons for this. One reason is you get to show them be bad with it and that's funny. When Luke gets shot by the little thing, that's funny, right? Uh, when a character is trying to use the magic and flops on their face, when Neo jumps off the building and can't leap and falls down, that's fun. These sorts of moments are really, they bond you to the character, you like watching them, and it's also each one of them is a promise that later on, I'm going to get able to see that character kick some butt, and I'm going to enjoy it because I feel vicariously like I had to suffer like they suffered through not being good at it. So later on, when they use the skill in a really interesting and cool way, you feel like they've earned it. You feel like you have earned that scene 
by reading all the scenes of them going, doing it poorly. Those hopefully weren't painful because the author wrote them the way that they're fun, but the, that whole thing that I like watching numbers count up on a spreadsheet, that principle works for almost everyone. We love seeing steps and progress. And if you are good at signposting this, people will not find your book boring. The best writers I know can write a story um, about like, uh, Lee Modisett has a scene where a character makes a barrel. He's a, he's a barrel right, whatever that's actually called. Um, what's that? Maybe, yeah. And he makes a barrel and it's like a whole chapter and it's fascinating because he's really good at this stuff. He signposts what needs to be happened. Watching someone who's really skilled at somewhat something, someone who's really skilled at something do it is fun for us to watch. And we get to see the barrel get made. It's the same reason that we enjoy baking shows, right? Watching people do something, if it is properly promised to us, is really exciting. Um, and there's this principle in storytelling that a lot of you are going to disagree with. I disagree with on moral principle. But the, uh, the principle of storytelling is that readers enjoy stories if they know what's going to happen. This has been studied numerous times in studies. Um, granted, it's a little bit, I mean, how do you study this? They usually say, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much did you enjoy this experience and stuff like that. But uh, the data seems pretty conclusive that people having movies and shows spoiled for them increases their enjoyment of that. I hate that, right? As my, I'm morally opposed to it. But it actually has a really good fundamental principle that, um, that is baked into all of us. Uh, I don't know if you guys have read, um, uh, which one is it? It's one of the Malcolm Gladwell books, the one that talks about, um, about Blue's Clues. Uh, which one is that? Outliers? I think it's Outliers. Might not be. Um, but regardless, what they did, the Blue's Clues made an interesting uh, revolution in children's programming by realizing that kids enjoyed Blue's Clues more if they'd seen the same episode a couple of times. And they were the first one to try airing the same episode five days a week. And what they found is that kids, preschoolers who watched this, got really excited because preschoolers are used to not knowing anything that's going to happen in stories. It's all new to them. And, but they could realize, oh, the, I know what's in the mailbox. It's the, it's the shoe. I saw this yesterday. And they loved being able to say, it's the shoe. I anticipated the story beat. That's really exciting to me. Readers love this across the board. This is why the promises are so important. Um, readers love being able to say, read the book and be like, wow, I bet Luke is going to get good at the force. Oh, wow, he's really good at the force now. That's fun. Figuring out what your, your progress is, and we can't go into it. Maybe next uh, plotting episode, I'll try to go into it a little bit more. Um, but all different subplot cycles all have kind of different progresses. Uh, relationship plots are a good example. Uh, if you want an in-depth look at a lot of these, uh, my podcast, Running Excuses, did a whole season. It's like season 11, I think, maybe 12, on what we call the elemental genres. Um, and this is where we just look at the progress for each type of kind of sub-genre. Uh, a, a relationship plot is, uh, is very commonly you can take the same things and apply them to different genres. Uh, like, I always like to point out that like a buddy cop movie and a romance generally use the same story beats, right? Uh, if you strip away and look at the core skeleton, they have very similar story beats. Um, Ender's Game and Hoosiers and uh, The Way of Kings all have the same story structure. So this is science fiction, this is a basketball um, uh, story, and uh, an epic fantasy. They're all the underdog sports story. They're all played very differently. Um, but you can find the same beats in Pitch Perfect that you find in Ender's Game. Um, this is understanding the difference between like this progress, the type of progress genre you're doing, and the trappings of your genre. And I should have mentioned when I was talking about your promises of genre, Genre can have both trappings and plots and you like progress associated with them, right? Like uh, a lot of people point out that Star Wars is kind of a space Western. It's using a Western story structure, but its trappings are science fiction with a little fantasy mixed in. Uh, so don't mistake your trappings for your plot. Uh, that, those are very easy to separate apart. Um, and part of being a chef, I would challenge you is going and 
to your favorite pieces of media, the books you've read, the movies you love, and start to ask yourself, what are the differences between the trappings and the actual plot skeleton and the sense of progress that we're getting? A lot of thrillers are creating a sense of urgency through someone chasing them, but at their core, they're either a travelogue or a mystery, right? Um, some of them are what we call heists. Um, that happens a lot too, but you just start to learn this stuff. Get yourself a book and start to break down what different types of plots you are seeing in the things that you love and ask yourself, why do they work? What do I love about them? What's the progress that they're making and why is it keeping me engaged? Good progress is the thing that keeps you turning the page. Uh, one of my favorites examples of this is a lesser known book uh, called Inferno um, by Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell, mostly known for their other science fiction work. This is a story about a science fiction author who gets drunk at a party, falls out a window, and wakes up in Dante's Inferno. Turns out that's the afterlife. Um, and it is mostly uh, because um, Larry and Jerry uh, grew up in an era where the, the, uh, the science fiction short in, uh, in magazines was a much bigger influence on the genre than it is now. Uh, a lot of stories from back then feel very episodic. This is one of them. It feels like they go to a place in the inferno and have an adventure with some dead historical figure and then move on to another one, right? Um, and it's just vignette after vignette um, of what if, you know, you went on a wacky adventure in Asphodel and Billy the Kid was there, right? Um, that's basically the premise. And I was reading this book and I was just eager to turn the page and I thought, this is really the definition of an episodic uh, thing. Why am I eager to turn the page? And it was actually really simple. Uh, they drew the inferno as a giant circle with a mysterious dot at the center, and they dropped him at the perimeter, and each adventure took him closer to the center. And I realized that that natural momentum of me following his progress along the travel log, even though each episode was episodic. It took him one step closer to the center and the big, cool mystery that was going to be there that was the way out of Dante's Inferno. Um, and I just was, you know, I was hooked. It's a very short book that works to its advantage also in this. Um, I, that map in that case was the thing to give me the sense of progress I needed. And they carefully signposted where we were along this map as we went. And that's all I needed for that story. I could see their progress. I knew I was making progress. You have an advantage in book storytelling that they know, the reader knows how many pages it is, and you're using those pages up and giving them a natural momentum. If you can make good on that by just making sure, if you have a mystery plot, you are giving information clues and signposting them as progress. If you have a relationship, you are showing that progress is, is getting made on that relationship. Even if there's a step backwards now and then, things are happening that reader can say, they're getting closer even if they don't realize it. These things are gonna, what's going to make your book interesting to read page by page.